Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Fredrickson Health Solutions. Today I am your host, Dr. Robert Fredrickson. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Kirsten. So Dr. Kirsten is here. She's a functional medicine provider in Oregon. She's a little bit, is it north or south of or, uh, Portland? South. 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 She is the owner of Northwest uh, Functional Medicine, right? Am I saying that right? You and she is posting amazing, amazing things on her Instagram. So that is why I brought her on here. She has, she's an athlete herself. She treats a lot of triathletes, a lot of CrossFitters, and she's seeing a lot of nutrient deficiencies that you typically don't think about in people that are doing healthy things. So today we're going to talk into the nuts and bolts of nutrient deficiencies, lab testing, why Dr. Kirsten doesn't like some at-home lab testing and why she does, and we're gonna, we're gonna get into it. So Dr. Kirsten, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, I'm so excited. <laughs> me too, me too. So for everyone listening, just um, tell everyone where you're from, how you got into functional medicine. Yeah, yeah, so I am in, uh, well, so currently my practice is in Wilsonville, Oregon. I live actually out in Oregon City and I have a little small hobby farm out here. Nice. I have a garden of my own, I have some chickens and some goats and um, just starting that process of being able to have your own food and grow your own food. I have friends around here that raise their, like raise pigs for me and cows and so it's great. It's a, it's a fun little space to be in. I. I got into functional medicine because of my own personal health stuff. Usually that's how doctors get into it. I right, think exactly. part, especially alternative medicine doctors, I think for the most part, we're all looking for solutions for ourselves. And then we land on this and we're like, ah, oh, I think I can Same do that for myself. Me. Same thing for me. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I started out with migraines, um, that were a product of, uh, Taking, well, there was a series of things, but uh, it, it does apply. So I, I got migraines from taking antibiotics uh, over a series of time for acne that, you know, looking back now, a lot of things could have changed, lifestyle, diet, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, as a teenager and even, you know, just back 15, 20 years ago, we really just didn't know about a lot of this stuff that was very, very, very under the radar, I think. Sure. Um, and so I started getting migraines after that. I had some other issues with um, other health things and just slowly declined over time, you know, through my undergrad and, and finally got out of undergrad with just migraines that you know, was getting at least once a month or once every couple of months. And I just felt like this was just not the way that I, I wanted to live. I felt like I was losing time and I didn't want to take medications. I didn't feel like that was appropriate. So finally I found a chiropractor who then was like, Kate, try this. And then I started getting into that. I started learning even more about nutrition after I got involved with CrossFit in 2010, started learning about paleo, figuring out how to clean up your diet. And slowly that led me into chiropractic school, which then I found the master's in human nutrition and functional medicine. I was like, oh, this aligns exactly with what I want to do. And so I got into that and I finished that a couple years after chiropractic school. And now uh, I work with athletes specific, predominantly, not specific, like all the time, but predominantly athletes and just trying to help not only with nutrient deficiencies and optimizing their performance, but I also work with them when they have chronic diseases and illnesses that come up like autoimmune disease, um, hypo, hyperthyroid, you know, stuff that just doesn't quite go right. Because I know we think of athletes as healthy people, which in general they are, but sometimes things fall apart. And for a series of reasons, uh, one of them are nutrient deficiencies <laughs> as a root cause. Um, but anyway, so I see that a lot. And so I work with them on helping them get back into doing their sport uh, and having longevity in that sport too. So. Right, because if you're loving your sport and you can't do your sport, you know, it's a big deal. It's going to devastate you even more. So it's yep. for someone who doesn't work out and they say, oh, now I can't work out because of an injury. It's, it's not that big of a deal. But if you're an athlete, you identify as an athlete and that's what you love to do and you can't do what you want to do because you're sick, you have a thyroid issue, et cetera. It's, it's a big deal. Right. Um, where did you go to chiropractic school? Oh, I went to University of Western States here in Portland. Um, They're like and, uh, really known for functional medicine, right? Yeah, and so they, they're one of, I think, actually the only chiropractic school that I know of that has a functional medicine master's program. Uh, and there's, there's several of other universities, though. So there's lots of other universities that you can get a degree in functional medicine, but I think they're the only chiropractic one. I'm I think sure. so, too. I'll have to look into that. So it's that's really awesome. Good. 
That's they're a great awesome. school. They focus on research. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it was fun. <laughs> awesome. So you work with a lot of um, CrossFitters, right? Yeah. Yep. And I work with triathletes. triathletes. Okay. Um, let's see what other runners, lots of runners. Lots of runners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And um, with your athletes, what are some of those common, I guess, nutrient deficiencies that you're seeing right now? And, uh, and do you have to do a lab test to know this or can you kind of tell by the symptoms? Mm. How, how does that it work? Depends. Yeah. Okay. So right. well, let me break this down into a couple place, a couple pieces. So you can figure out if you have a nutrient deficiency based on, um, I would say your best bet is to get some lab work done just to be a little bit more specific. You'll hear most of the time that I'm going to suggest testing and not guessing. I think first off, it, it may seem like you're spending a bit of cash to get those tests done, but I think it's a lot more effective and efficient than just guessing and wasting time. So nutrient deficiencies and nutrient labs specifically, which we can get into in a, a little bit later, uh, but they can be anywhere from testing urine to testing serum, so blood samples, to looking at hair samples. There's some people that will pull labs via hair and they'll kind of look. I have some specifics that I like personally, uh, but there's lots and lots of variety. And then there's also a lot of variety of labs. So you've got to be, I think, in some ways a little bit careful and just mm, – research before you just go and spend money with a lab. I think uh, there's some better quality ones out there than others. So yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to talk a lot about that later. Um, so as far as just micronutrient deficiencies, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure you see a lot of iron deficiency in women, mm -hmm. right? Can we talk mm -hmm. about what the symptoms for that and what you're seeing in your patient? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So some of the common ones, I would say uh, fatigue for the most part, are going to be your common symptoms of iron deficiencies. Uh, also, along the lines with if you bruise really easily. So I would I would say that's probably even one of the more common ones. But when I see athletes that just this is this is kind of the picture of what happens. So they're training okay. through the season. Uh, sometimes they will come in and they'll just say like, yeah, I'm just bruising a lot easier. You know, something's kind of wonky there. But most of the time, they'll start to see a decline in their training. So they'll start to see their numbers kind of get lower, low and lower. Like they're just not recovering well. They're getting a, just tired, um, really, really severe fatigue, things like that, that just kind of come on fairly quickly uh, because your body uses up stores. It, it really does store quite a bit of vitamins and minerals, including like B vitamins, things like that. It stores up a lot of that. And then it just takes a while before you, if you're still not getting it in through your diet and lifestyle and your environment, um, then it will use up those stores. And then once it has, it just drops. So oftentimes uh, patients will come in and they'll say like, I just am getting more and more and more and more tired. The problem though, is that you have to determine if we're looking at something like chronic fatigue syndrome, or if we're looking at something like an iron deficiency, stuff like that. So those are your most common things with iron. Um, and then there are some people who genetically just happen to not just absorb or use iron appropriately. So you've, there's some factors there too that, and usually though, those people know it by now. Um, they, they've just had a chronic deficiencies of iron because uh, they've just been tired. Their life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, calcium is another one I see often. And of course, being in the Pacific Northwest, I see vitamin D deficiency. I'd actually say I'd see vitamin D deficiency more than I see calcium deficiency okay. just because I'm in the Pacific Northwest, but also I think people know that calcium is something that is important for their bones, but they don't always know that vitamin D is really important for their bones. Right. So there's uh, frequently I see deficiencies there. Uh, what's another one? Oh, I also see B vitamin deficiencies across the board. Okay. So they vary, vary a lot. They vary a lot per person, and each one can have different kind of signs and symptoms. But yeah, so those I'd say are fairly common. Okay. Magnesium, you see that at all? I mean, everyone's deficient in magnesium, yeah. not just athletes, but. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So minerals, definitely. So the tests that I run, we look at a lot, like pretty much all of the vitamins. We even look at alpha lipoic acid. We look at vitamin C, we look at vitamin E, we look at vitamin A, and then we get into the minerals when we start looking at vitamin, or I'm sorry, we start looking at zinc, at magnesium, manganese, which is, I see manganese really? um, as deficient a lot, which is super interesting. That and then is. I also see, you know, and then potassium and all of that. So yeah, we, we kind of get a little bit deeper. Uh, we also, also, we look at copper. So copper. Okay. 
like copper zinc relationships and that sort of thing. Very yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. And then they all tie into symptoms. So yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> I feel like iron is something we should talk about a little bit yeah. more because okay. women start to lose that aerobic capacity. We know that iron yes. is carrying hemoglobin, which is our mm. oxygen to our red blood mm -hmm. cells, and so. So you see women that are losing performance, they're trying to work out harder, maybe they're not getting the same benefits, and that's like, okay, right. something might be going on here. And so what kind of levels, um, for anyone who knows the levels, like what, what kind of levels would you deem you know, you know, adequate and some that you deem deficient? Mm, for iron specifically, I'm going to say that this one actually does depend on the lab that you run. Got so it. I, I can give you I can give you numbers, but it's more... I, uh, there are, okay, let me go with this. There are optimal levels usually within the normal range. And so when we're taking, so let's say you go into your doctor and you say, hey, I need you to run a lab. If you are specifically looking because of fatigue and that decrease in aerobic capacity and all of that, there are two that you want to really make sure you look at. You want to make sure you get iron. And then I also want you to get them to run a vitamin B12 serum test. Nice for two reasons. One, so iron is, as you mentioned, you have to have it in order for, um, well, yeah, you have to have it. <laughs> it's, sure. and fee, women in particularly, you will lose a lot of it. Um, this is why it's so classically an issue with women is because of the cycles. So sure. you lose blood. You ha so if you, and also I think I see this a lot in people who do not get it enough from their diet. So if I'm working with a vegetarian or a vegan athlete, there's a lot of things that I have to do if they're just not wanting to eat red meat. And I have no qualms either way. You you do you whatever is important great but let carnivore, me help you carnivore yeah. vegetarian yeah but whatever. let me help you make sure that everything makes sense now the thing the reason why I want you to do vitamin B12 is because when um, there's and there's a article that we can link uh, later but their mm -hmm. uh, vitamin B12 um, can also have anemias that are associated with it and it can change the way your red blood cells function. So vitamin B12 um, may help you have a better oxygen capacity um, if, if you have enough of it. And so it's in, and also may help you have a little bit more hemoglobin synthesis too. So again, if, if you see something like an iron deficiency, I kind of want to know more. Like why? Yeah, why? Are there some why? other Root components cause. that go along with it? Yeah. So, and there's more to talk about that as far as the why goes too. But does that answer that question? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it's, okay. it's not just a deficiency in iron. It's like, why are you deficient in iron? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the B12. Maybe it's some other factors. Maybe you're mm -hmm. stressed. Maybe you're depleting mm -hmm. your micronutrient reserves because, right. because of chronic cortisol. Right. Um, yes. 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 All, all those things. And so I guess just to simplify, if, if you had an iron deficiency, first step and maybe be eat some foods that are high in iron, right? Mm -hmm. If you're vegetarian, yeah. you might supplement with a yes. diet maybe. Yeah. So, so a couple of things, iron supplements are awesome for getting your levels back up to where you want them to be. What you will often find is when your doctor says, okay, you've been iron deficient. Well, this is what they should say. I should say <laughs> um, is that when you start taking the iron supplement, you'll only take it for a certain amount of time. And then you're going to stop taking it because once you've got your levels back up to the proper level, you should be okay. Just as you mentioned, every once in a while, something odd happens in the physiology. So sometimes you're maybe more stressed than others, or maybe in your training cycle, you just required a lot more uh, of different types of vitamins and minerals, and you didn't get them for whatever reason. And so usually people don't need to be just on this perpetual iron supplement all the time. Um, that's actually, I would say, kind of a misuse of iron supplements, unless you are in a situation where you just can't eat meat or don't eat meat. Um, that would be another area. But also keeping in mind that there are some you know, types of foods that you can get vitamins and minerals from, like that certain, certain types of vegetables that can, can bring those on too. But again, meat is your, better, is your best source. For sure. For sure. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Test, don't guess. Find yeah. out what's going on. You know, I say that all the right. time. Very cool. Right. So if, yeah. I guess if you were taking an iron supplement, there's a lot of different ones out there. Do you have a certain one that you like to use? Or a certain uh, I know people. Yeah. So I like to just look for one. I, I commonly use supplements from Designs for Health is okay. a company that I use a lot, yep. but I have several. Um, the, the thing is though, is you want to make sure that 
there are some different types of vitamins that you want to couple together. So com some people know that with iron, you want to make sure you're coupling with vitamin C. Sure. Similarly, vitamin D, you'll usually want to take that with like a CalMag um, because calcium and magnesium are more easily absorbed. But if you don't, or sorry, absorbed, if you don't get enough of those, then, and if you, especially if you don't have enough calcium, then sometimes you won't be able to utilize and absorb vitamin D very well. So there's some that you just really want to make sure that are all coupled together so that you actually use them well. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Let's talk about vitamin D and uh, what yeah. kind of like deficiencies are you seeing over there in Oregon? Okay. So very, very often, especially if we're coming out of the winter season, I see vitamin D deficiencies because guess what? So, the, and this is important. This is actually a really great point. So vitamin D is something that we generally get for from, it's a, it's a nutrient that we generally get from our environment. So it's not just about eating certain foods. Vitamin D is something that you absorb through your skin because of the sun. And I think this is, uh, an important point because we, we, we constantly are driving home that food is important. But there are, a lot of, there are a lot of ways that we get things from our environment. We get them from like water. We get them from being outside and in the sun. And there's, there's just so many more things that we can. And um, we can actually change our microbiome and our bacteria if we're like touching soil, you know, and we're kind of on farms and we're around different types of bacteria. So I really want people to be just thinking about it is your entire environment that can affect your health, not just the food that you eat. So let's stop putting so much pressure on food necessarily, and let's start thinking about our lifestyle as a whole. Um, so when it comes to vitamin D, uh, one of the things that I see a lot with athletes particularly is that um, they use a lot of vitamin D. You also need vitamin D for your immune system and for a really healthy immune system. So it's, it's helpful for bone health, it's helpful for your immune system, and it can be helpful with recovery and muscle regeneration. So one of the things, actually, this is a personal story that I found. So last year I was training for an uh, Ironman 70.3, so half okay. Ironman. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was an interesting experience. I'm training for a full this year. Your but first what one? happened, yep, my first one. Oh, wow. They canceled, it was actually supposed to be at the end of July, but they canceled it off for obvious reasons. Um, but they've rescheduled it for the end of October, so I'm back in training trying to catch up. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. super exciting. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm thrilled to get to this point. It's been a long time coming. But so a couple of months before my half Ironman, I did a squat work. And so I've been training for almost a year at this point. So halfway through, or a couple months before, I did a squat workout that, you know, was a normal part of my training. And I remember... The next day and about two, it was, it was a week and a half and I still hadn't recovered. Now being me, like I've done, I did massage, I did like, you know, all of the nutrition stuff to try to recover and I couldn't, I couldn't explain what was happening. So what I did was I ran a NutriVal panel, which is the nutrition and vitamin mineral panel that I run in my, in my office on my athletes. And I found that I was extremely deficient in vitamin D, like under 30. So wow. and usually you want to see anywhere between 30 to 100. What was your number at? Oh, I, I can pull it up, but I think it was at 20, 22 or 25. It was really, 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 really low. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And Are I was- supplementing too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a genetic so, like VDR? Uh, no, no, I don't. Um, okay. No, I just was coming out of the winter season. And okay. I think even with the supplementing that I was doing, it just wasn't enough. So what I, what I realized, and this is what's so awesome about this and crazy is that I fixed that vitamin D deficiency, obviously by supplementing quite a bit over what the normal daily amounts are recommended to be. Sure. And within, within just a couple of weeks, my like muscles recovered, things started getting a lot better. I was a lot more cognizant of, you know, I did a lot more of my training outside after that point. I did a nice. lot more, you know, I was looking at, I was looking at my food in a different way, you know, and just consistently trying to get in all sorts of colors and different types of variety of nutrients. I looked at my GI tract and started working on that to make sure I was actually going to absorb it, which we also should talk about. <laughs> we should, we should. And, and um, 
so this panel that I ran gave me so much information about what was happening inside. And the thing is, is that it allowed me not to waste any more time. I was able to like get it all under control, continue training, and then also be able to do my half Ironman. And it was great because a couple of days later after my half, I was like ready to train again, you know? So I think that it's, it really helped with recovery, but it also just kind of, kind of stuck in my brain that this stuff is important and it's, it's necessary. Yes. You, you know so yes i preach it all the time for vitamin d i'm like get your levels oh. tested you can go anywhere you don't have to go to the doctor i mean we, we'll talk about that too but i think it's no, important to know your levels because the standard reference range is on if you're over 30 you're good mm -hmm. in quotation marks yes i'll know that you should probably be a little, little bit higher some people say right. 50, 75 that's right. what i typically say but I've yeah seen like eight you know yes yeah, six, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh and you're like right okay, like, how are you functioning, right? Mm -hmm. And they're not usually. I mean, right. usually there's, their systems are, are struggling at that point, for sure. Uh, the other thing, too, as far as reference ranges go, which I, I wanted to kind of tack on to what we talked about a little bit before, is that the difficulty with reference ranges is that they can be very, very wide. So, again, so 30 to 100 being the okay range is a huge variance <laughs> like that's massive and it's the same thing with thyroid hormones it's a it's commonly the same thing with estrogen it's the same thing with or, or any type of hormone panel that you run um i mean i think i can't remember what the uh tsh reference ranges ranges are for uh thyroid hormone but they have like a five to seven point reference range um which is insane because people usually operate really well in a smaller than a smaller range but if you're within normal limits on those labs then they just say well we don't know what's wrong with you like you're within you're normal but the person in front of you does not feel good if they're on the you they know outer normal, range of right. that right so i think that we need to start um thinking a little bit more critically about the labs that we're looking at and then the patient that's sitting in front of us because if a patient has come in and they're saying like i don't feel good <laughs> like i feel like garbage every day and like i'm cold all the time or like i can't recover well i su feel super fatigued i'm slow like oh there's just something not right and we don't see it on a lab that doesn't mean there isn't something wrong and we need to start actually figuring out what's happening with that patient because we've mismanaged i think a lot of people so that's my soapbox preach <laughs> preach love it <laughs> uh, so how so how many just to, uh, to recap vitamin d how much how many ius are you taking daily when your levels mm -hmm. were 22 then what did you up it to, yeah. to get your levels more adequate yeah so i was taking um and i'll actually give this a caveat as well so i am typically the kind of person that doesn't like to take a lot of supplements in okay. general i prefer to try to get it as much from food as possible um and so i don't i don't love to just be constantly taking a multivitamin every day and i'm not consistent at it either so i'll just be straight up with that <laughs> so that, like you know if I tell somebody to take a multivitamin, ideally, I'm not going to have them on it forever. Do they have benefits? For sure. But I just don't typically do that. Um, so I was taking at that point anywhere between two to 4,000 IUs, okay. depending, um, but inconsistently. Uh, so then when I found that out, I took anywhere between 10,000 IUs to 15. Thousand I use, but here's what I did, and this is something I've learned a little bit over time: is that they we can actually get uh, adapted to different types of uh, nutrient levels that we take in. So think about coffee, for example. When we drink coffee, and if we drink it for a series of a period of time, we often will adapt to those levels, and then need more in order to get the same effect right exactly yep um same thing with working out you don't actually get your adaptations to uh training from the workout itself it's usually the nervous system and the muscles on the uh, later on in the day that say oh well if we're gonna have to do that again tomorrow then i don't want to be back in that state so then we we adapt we try to figure out how to be better and build those neurons and those types of things in order to make it so that the next day we're slightly more prepared for what we did today 
the same thing seems to be the case with not only intermittent fasting and fasting, but also with um, vitamins and minerals. I was listening to somebody talk about some supplements that they had created, and they were talking about this phase of, of taking a supplement for a certain number of days and then taking a few days off and then taking the supplement for a certain number of days and then taking two days off or two or three or whatever. But the point is that you give yourself that time to adapt and to absorb and to use it. Um, and then that just seems to be a slightly more effective way and efficient way of using supplements than just taking them consistently over time. Right. And of course you're going to test your levels obviously right and if you know you're deficient right. you take something you don't just take something all the time i i will usually take sundays off from supplements like yeah. i take a lot of supplements i, I i've always done it I, I feel better uh yeah but, i'm not <laughs> saying they're bad <laughs> yeah i take them all the time but i sundays i usually just say i'm not going to take anything today maybe like one fish oil and that's it but um typically yeah. i just take sundays off Right, and they have a lot of benefits to them. Um, so I, you, so I took ten thousand to fifteen thousand IU's for a certain period of time, right? And then as I started feeling a lot better, recovering, I started bringing that down um, because there are certain vitamins and minerals that can be toxic at certain levels. And so we don't, and honestly, I haven't seen patients really have any issues with vitamin D at higher levels to, to I mean, I know they say that it could be a risk, but I really haven't seen that many issues. That doesn't mean it won't be or it can't be. So I typically will say, okay, if you start feeling better, we're going to drop that down and then, you know, continue on because we right. want to be safe. <laughs> right. Just want to be safe. And did you yeah. check your levels later and see if you had a yeah. big increase? Yeah, so I did. And I, I was able to bring those back into normal level. Also, I had a couple of other things like alpha lipoic acid and glutathione that were pretty low as well, which are pretty big detox and liver hormone right. um, pieces. And then I also was deficient in vitamin B6, B2. And then I think I had, I think it was B9 and B12 that I was deficient in as well. So um, yeah, I took a pretty significant B complex um, for a while too, to bring those up. And Vitamin B2 actually can have a significant impact on migraines and headaches. And so I wasn't necessarily surprised to see that. But yeah, so anyway, there's, there was a lot that popped up on that one. Wow. And how did you feel after getting your levels back? Did you oh, feel the difference? feel like a brand new person. And every <laughs> once in a while too, you know, like now if I, if I start feeling a certain way, I start to kind of guess and, and think about, okay, what, what could potentially be going on here? Um, just because after doing this for a while, things start to have patterns. And, and so right. I can sometimes be like, mm, okay, well, we're going to take that and we're going to take that and we're going to take that. Exactly. <laughs> start adding to the pile of things you're taking. I do that too. I do that too. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm starting to feel a little creaky. I'm going to take this collagen, take this glucose. I mean, whatever. So. Oh yeah, for sure. All, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. Okay. Vitamin D. We talked about iron. We talked a little bit about B vitamins. I know you have a ton of great information about migraines and you talk about them all the mm -hmm. time. Let's talk about some B vitamin deficiencies that you see in your athletes and how they can correlate to migraines, but also yeah. correlate to performance issues, fatigue, sure. et cetera. For sure. Yeah. So B vitamins as a whole are huge for uh, fatigue in general. Like usually you'll see like some type of energy supplement is going to have B vitamins of some type. And a lot of the times when patients come in, I'm generalizing quite a bit, but a lot of the times when patients come in with chronic fatigue or fatigue of some type, B vitamins are one of the first things they go on. Now here's why. B vitamins are used by a ton of different processes in the body, a ton. So first off, they're necessary for certain phases in the liver for detoxification. They are necessary for immune, the immune system. They're needed by the nervous system. Now, certain ones are needed by certain things, but they're generalizing again that some are needed by the nervous system. Some are utilized by the adrenals right off the bat. What's actually really interesting is that people think that they take vitamin C and vitamin B for their immune system, but most often, if they are taking it for that, their adrenals will take that up first before they'll even give it to the immune system. So, so, so interesting. Uh, so, Very and then interesting. B, mm -hmm, so vitamin B2 is helpful if you have headaches, you know, chronic headaches, things like that. Um, and then I actually... 
vitamin B6 was one that was deficient for me, and it can be extremely helpful for people who get menstrual type cramps um, and just situations and symptoms around their periods that are just not super fun. B6 can be one of the things that is on a list of like magnesium and some other ones, omega-3s, that can be really helpful for trying to settle that stuff down too. Awesome. Okay. I should also mention B9 is in oh, wait, yep. most parents know this, but B9 is really, really helpful for the brain and for nervous system. So uh, parents know this, but, it, or maybe they've, they will know it now is that uh, B9 is, is necessary for helping the, the neural tube form in infants and um, in, in babies, fetuses. So having enough of that within the first four to six weeks of pregnancy is extremely helpful. So being deficient in things like that can be, um, can, but I will say with B9 uh, and B12, it is, especially in, with folic acid, it would, it's better if you can get it through food than getting it through a supplement because folate and folic acid, which are B9, are, are uh, yeah, and they are different. And then your body and your brain will react to them differently. So I just think that it's better, and you'll hear me say this a lot, but it is better if you can get certain things through food. Always, right? Always. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the cereals and stuff, I don't think a lot of people realize, a lot of the cereals, processed food, whatever, is fortified with folic right. acid, not the active folate. And so we see a lot of deficiencies because we know – through genetic testing, like 70% of people have MTHFR deficiencies. And so their ability to absorb folate is diminished, you know, 70% of their homozygous, 30% of right. their hetero. And so, and I'm also, I don't know how, how much truth, truth there is to this, but Dr. Ben Lynch talks a lot about, about folic acid, like blocking the folate yeah. receptors. And so that yeah. can actually happen to cause even more deficiency or mask That's a deficiency right. that you don't even know about. So it's so critical to, to get mm -hmm. your, uh, your B vitamins in. Of course, food first, supplement second, but again, test don't guess, right? And find out what's going on, why you're having these issues. Right. I, I know a lot of prenatals now, the good ones anyways, are having methylfolate, methylcobalamin. Yes. Yeah. The, you know, this uh, right. superior absorption form of the B vitamins. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, so that's interesting. So also on the NutraVal lab, I'm not promoting this one by any means, but but it's just one that I use a lot in my, in my, uh, in my clinic, but the, the, so the methylated factors, there's a reason why a lot of the, the better B vitamins are methylated. So you'll see methylcobalamin, as you mentioned, methylfolate is because they have getting a little bit into chemistry here. They have a methyl donor on them, which means that when you absorb it, you're going to be able to automatically use it like pretty quickly in your system. Right. If you take just a normal B vitamin that's like cobalamin, which is vitamin B12, or folate, for example, which is vitamin B9, if you then just take those in those forms, then your body has to take a methyl donor from somewhere, put it onto the B12 to then be able to transport it and use it elsewhere. What I see fairly often in my, on those NutraVal panels is that people have methylation on the lower borderline to red side. It happens quite often. Um, so sometimes what I'll say is if people are, are, again, it's how you know how to read the lab, right? It's right. I see B vitamins are just consistently low over time because like, with a lot of my athletes, I'm trying to you know get them to, to make sure that they're making a baseline and then tracking over time. So we're running these labs sometimes multiple times a year or at least once a year so we can keep up with what they're doing and making sure that we catch these things before they become problems. But if you consistently see those things and you see those methyl factors, you know, maybe it's helpful to put in a methylated or a methylation type supplement to help boost that system because either maybe genetically there's an issue there or their body just needs a lot more of it. And so putting in a lot more of it is helpful. <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we touched on B vitamins. We, do we go over calcium? A little bit. Uh, briefly. I think that um, for the most part, I think that vitamin D is a lot more helpful than calcium as far as bone health goes. To stress that point though, um, if you're worried about calcium, if you're an endurance athlete, if you're you know somebody who is at risk of stress fractures, I think it's more important to talk about variety of the foods that you're eating and to also talk about vitamin D. 
So calcium, for the most part, if you are doing any type of weight bearing exercise, your body is going to be able to use what you get from your food fairly easily, and it will build up bone density. So every time you do weight bearing exercise, that and honestly, that kind of includes walking, but. Right. Um, but if you put, you know, even three pound dumbbells on your shoulders and you do a squat, that's still technically a weight bearing exercise. So you will build bone over time and bone density if you continue to keep that as a part of your normal routine. The, the issue, though, is that when we've started to cut out big food groups like all of dairy um, and all of whole grains, because gluten is problematic for a lot of people. This is where we start to get, or if we're not eating any more fortified cereals or anything like that, where you used to be getting a lot of your calcium sure. from, we do need to make sure that, uh, and I am one of those people that will suggest avoiding inflammatory foods for the most part, because they do tend to cause inflammation in the body. And that can cause things like chronic knee pain that athletes just don't really like to have or chronic joint pain, right? I want right. to be able to train pain-free as much as possible. So I try to avoid things that are going to increase inflammation in my body. But we still have to remember that things like whole grains have all sorts of nutrients in them. Uh, things like dairy have all sorts of things, including calcium. So cheese is going to be a huge calcium donor. Um, so what can you do find the vegetables do just a quick google search and search for like the top three or four veggies that have a lot of calcium in them and make sure you eat them periodically and honestly that's that's the best um and yeah calcium again is just deficiencies of that usually show up in bone health right it's yeah it's, it's normally not calcium in my experience it's it's the whole complex it's the vitamin d not getting stimulation yep. from the parathyroid glands it's the magnesium you know right. so it's right. not just calcium yeah. Okay. I'm keeping things fairly simple here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, we, we've touched on the, the vitamins. Let's, I just want to talk just real quick. Yeah. Like, what are some, just some really like interesting or amazing stories or patient testimonies, the results you've had maybe in the past year that you don't mind sharing yeah. with like yeah, patients who've yeah. had nutrient deficiencies and mm -hmm. what you've seen, what kind of symptoms they were seeing before and how they felt after. For sure. Okay. So you heard mine which is um, with the vitamin D and, and just really having difficulty recovering. Another one, so she came in, she's training still. Um, she was actually supposed to go to sanctionals in a new format that the way CrossFit does things. Um, she had qualified to go to that. I, I have been working with her over the past two or three years now, I think at this point. And when she first came in, she was getting sick oh, I think I recorded like four or five times. She was just sick with the cold and flu through her training season. And I was like, girl, <laughs> we need to work on that. But that was one of the best things. So we pulled some, we pulled some labs and we looked at some of her numbers. Um, and again, like B vitamins, vitamin C, you know, some of your, just your typical stuff, guys. Like this is not super, um, out of the, this is not out of the blue, uh, but just looking at some of those numbers really showed us that her body was probably just taking so much of that for other things that her immune system, her adrenals were just not getting enough of it. So we fixed those things. And one of her best, one of her best things that she said is that I went through an entire season and I just, just didn't get the cold or flu. Like we built up her immune resiliency so much so that no longer was she getting sick with the cold and flu. And, you know, she was still in a gym environment. She was still working with kiddos. You know, she was still doing all these things. But this time she was able to train through most of her season versus get sick. So that's awesome. that was one. Yeah. The, another one that I worked with was a runner and what, and she was training for a marathon, but what was happening for her is, uh, and this had more specifically to do with her period. So it was more of like a chronic yeah. inflammation, um, scenario. And she would basically hemorrhage every time she would get a period. And uh, obviously if you're losing a lot of blood, iron, I mean, you name it, right? There's lots and lots of nutrients that you're gonna lose if you're basically hemorrhaging every time, like lots and lots of blood every time you have your period. 
And sometimes that period would last for like months, you know, and it would just go and go and go and go and go. So one of the things we had to do was take a step back and look at where does inflammation ultimately come from? There's lots of different causes. So it can be environment. As I mentioned, you can look at food, you can look at, are there toxins in water or the things that you're putting on your skin or you're cleaning your house with? Are you, are you living in a fairly toxic area? You know, are you breathing in a lot of toxins from cars and plants and all sorts of stuff that people live next to? Are you stressed? out of your marbles that also has a significant impact like on right now with a lot of people <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> maybe uh, yeah just a little just a teensy bit um also uh another thing that we need to look at too is the gut so uh your immune system there's probably the numbers vary, but there's somewhere between 60 to 70% of your immune system is at the level of your GI tract. And I think that as we're starting to learn more about the, back, about the microbiome and about bacteria and about how all of it's situated and works, there's quite a bit of inflammation that can happen systemically, so all over the body, if you have an inflamed GI tract. So... It's sometimes about looking at what specifically is happening. It, so for example, with the uterus or the ovaries or you know, in the, the reproductive areas, but most of the time patients have already come to me with so many labs that have eliminated so many of the red flags and the bad things and they don't have an answer for what's happening. And we are able to take a step back and say, well, physiologically, why would you have inflammation at that level? Is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it you know, this or that? She also, she was, if I'm remembering correctly, again, B vitamins. I see it all the time. B6, same thing. We ran, um, we actually also ran a microbiome, so a bacteria panel on her gut. Cool. And inf inflammation wise, so there's lots and lots of things that you can test with that, which are super exciting. And I don't want to bore people here, but there's, there's some inflammatory markers, and there's also, we can look at not only the bacteria that's in the gut, but we can also look at the environment that's in the gut. Because we got to remember that if you want bacteria to stick around in your gut, the good stuff, you have to feed it so it stays there. Otherwise, the bad bacteria, like a Petri dish, will just outgrow the good right. stuff and sprout them out, over. right? Yep. They'll just take over. And then they create all sorts of complicated things and that make it very tricky to get rid of them um, sometimes. Anyway. Same thing happened for her, lots of inflammatory markers. We kind of just had to do a complete rework of the GI tract. And we, we ultimately made it to a point where not only was she running again, but her periods were not, they weren't impacting her running at all. She was able to go out and run with the group and not have to be worried about potentially just, you know, bleeding all over the place. I mean, picture how that sounds, right? Like going running with a group of friends and women and potentially just bleeding everywhere. It feels insanely embarrassing, right? Like I just said, I wouldn't want to go out, right? So yes, of course. Literally about giving people their lives back and getting to do the sports that they love. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So now we're probably going to go down the rabbit hole, but I'm ready. Yeah, let's do it. So, leaky gut and athletes, yeah. everyone's like, well, working out is healthy, doing all these things are healthy for my body. But a lot of people, a lot of athletes don't know that high intensity exercise does cause some intestinal permeability and studies after studies are not showing this. And so I've been doing a lot of research into this. I, I'm, I'm going to actually launch a blog post on it later, but yeah, go ahead and just talk about the athletes you're seeing with gut issues. Cause I, I don't think a lot of people know that athletes do get these things mm -hmm. from the exercise yeah. they're doing. So they have to do things in order to repair rest days, recovery days. Yes. You know, probiotics, fiber, whatever have you, or okay. just eating, eating foods that are rich in probiotics, right? So yeah, right. let's talk about okay. a little bit. Yeah. Let's make sure that I hit all those points because I want to talk about each of those that you just said. So number one, when we are starting to look at what is happening in the gut, I've seen actually a couple really interesting studies. One I saw, which I can link as well, is they were comparing elite athletes with, in the microbiome in elite athletes with, um, and it wasn't very clear on what type of elite athlete they were talking about, which is one issue I had with it. But 
they looked at that, uh, the microbiome of them, and then they looked at a control group. And actually what was interesting is one of the things that they found is these super high performers had more abundance in their GI tract microbiome than the control group, which is awesome, which basically suggests, yeah, that people who are these higher performers potentially have a GI tract that supports that. So potential so possibly possibly i'm just gonna speak in these terms possibly that means that they're going to be absorbing nutrients better which means they're going to be utilizing nutrients better which means that their immune system is going to be functioning properly and then they're going to probably recover a lot better and be able to use and adapt from the stressors that they put on their bodies a lot better so it sort of makes sense but it also kind of goes along the lines of how important your bacteria is for your overall health now Yes, very significant. So we can have stressors that are emotional or mindset, mind, you know, that happen in our lives or in our work lives or whatever, but we can also have physical stressors. Physical stressors like things that are like autoimmune disease, hyperthyroid, hormones that are off, um, putting in inflammatory foods into our bodies can cause internal physical stressors or being exposed to too many toxins and your liver gets overloaded because you drank a lot of alcohol the night before and then you were exposed to all this stuff and then the liver's just like, ah, I can't handle it all. There's a lot of different ways that we can have internal physiological stress. There's also the, you know, working out and training and causing a lot of stress on the body can create more stress. Stress in itself is over um, villainized. <laughs> stress, stress is a really important thing. We need it. You know, you, you don't show up to a work call or an interview prepared without stress. Like stress is, helps you perform well. But at the same time, we need to be thinking about if we're putting stress into the body, then we need to be doing the things that support the body to be able to handle it. Otherwise, we end up with things like a lot more reactive oxidative stress, so ROS, which can lead to free radicals, which can lead to unhealthy aging, lots of wrinkles, feeling like, you know, you're, so this is, this is a common one. People in their 50s, 60s-ish, or heck, even in their 30s, they're like, man, I just, feel awful. This is how aging goes. Like, this is terrible. Well, for a lot of people, what they don't know is you can actually age backwards. It takes some time and some learning, and you have to be really, really interested in it because you're going to have to go down some deep dive holes, but you can age backwards. And I think that's, so this whole aging thing of like, oh, you're, you're holding up a book. <laughs> this book. It's called Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have to. Yes. It's how we can By reverse. Sinclair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that can happen in in and on and going on all around our body that can cause us to age. We can also do some things to counteract that. So things like, for example, antioxidants, eating foods that are super colorful. Talking about blueberries here. Talking about sweet potatoes because they're orange, right? Talking about green leafy veggies, broccoli, which helps to support the liver and and uh, P450 enzyme and all that. Um, talking about uh, green tea even, black teas. We're talking about tomatoes and red peppers and green peppers and yellow peppers. All sorts of different things can help to support the system and, and they, they, they put antioxidants into the system to kind of help counteract those free radicals and reactive oxygen species, which means that your body is able to take stress and have it have a positive impact without having a significant negative impact. I think that's kind of a decent way to say that. So then um, the other thing is rest you mentioned. So for athletes who are training, 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 and then they're just not really sure how many days to rest, one of the things that I do is I use an elite heart rate variability um, app. That's literally what it's called is elite HRV, but I use a heart rate variability app and then I track my heart rate variability and the, the, I don't I do not wear anything at night. There, there are some things that you can use, um, like called the, there's a couple of rings and some different things that you can use to yeah. track your variability over time. But I think one of the easiest accessible accessibility things is just to have, you know, one of those chest wraparound um, monitors. And I would just put that on at the beginning, um, in the morning, first thing I do, grab that monitor, put it around my waist, you've got to be in the same position. So I always lay down in my bed, just to take some time to just breathe and just chill right before I start my day. It keeps me off my phone. It's, it's brilliant. 
Um, and so I just wait two and a half minutes for it to give me my reading. And then I get to see if I'm in like a good range, like the day before I did a good job at making sure I took care of myself, or it can be in the sympathetic range or the parasympathetic range. And they each mean something different. Point being, athletes can start to learn more about the types of training that they're putting into their bodies. They can learn more about the types of nutrition that they're putting into their bodies. Are they drinking enough water? Are they spending time resting? Are they doing meditation exercises? Are they breathing a lot? Um, doing a lot of different things to help counteract the stressors that we put on our body. And you can measure it so you can see and take it into account. You know, if you're sore and you have a, you know, parasympathetic heart rate variability response um, data, then you can use that to say, okay, maybe today the workout I should do is something more like active recovery. And the benefit of it is that you can then start to fuss. You can start to fuss with nutrition. You can start to fuss with different supplements. You can start to you know, do sleep. How many hours of sleep are you getting? And then you can start to see how you're, you can basically, and you can see how your body adapts to exercise too. So you'll start to see over time as you train that it gets better and better and better. You know, your body tends to adapt more and more and more. So that's a lot of things to talk about in one piece, but that's, that's the journey that people can go on when, you know, if you think that you're creating, and I forgot, we'll get into intestinal permeability here in a second. <laughs> um, sorry. There's just so many things to unpack. Yeah. In, yes. Um, but there's, but th those are some of the different ways that we can actually start testing and we can start paying attention to the stressors that we're putting onto our body and then how our body's reacting to them. So I'll get into leaky gut now. So leaky okay. gut has what is been- the, What is the band that you use real quick for the- Oh, I use Polar. So Polar, okay. Polar. Yeah. yeah. Basically so all you, I man. did- yeah, yeah. So all I did was I went to Elite HRV and I downloaded the app and they have a website as well. And they do have um, a heart rate monitor that you can buy, but Polar was one of the ones that they connected with and I already had it at home. So my right. mode of, my method of entry was free basically. And so I was like, this is great. Um, but even like their heart rate variability monitor is not that expensive. So if you don't have one, you can always get one through them and it just, you know, puts on your finger and it's great. It works really well. Yeah. Um, I swear the whoop bands a lot. And then yeah, I, that's another one that works then well. Then I got broke and I was playing basketball and I got real mad. So I I didn't, oh, I yeah. didn't get another one, but yeah. I also don't love wearing things at night. I think that it would come off not, a lot. Yeah, and I'm really not like completely on the wavelength that we should be, you know, turning off the Wi Fi at night yeah, and like, all, that. Yep. all that kind of stuff. But I don't think that it's um too far off though, you know. So I, I just don't go to those links to do that. But I don't think like wearing a watch all night long that has like a light on it that's constantly putting energy, you know, into your system. Sure. I just think there's some things that if you're not sleeping well, maybe we should troubleshoot some different things. That's all. Right. Yeah. And it was always interesting because every time I got my readings back, it was like, okay, I know I didn't sleep good. It would tell me that, right? It would tell me, hey, right. this is not a good day to train because I didn't sleep good. I, I knew that already. Mm -hmm. So now I have the, uh, I just have the simple pulse ox next to my nightstand. I'll wake up, I'll put my finger, I'll see where my resting heart rate is. If it's significantly Perfect. higher, like 10 beats higher, I'm like, okay, maybe I should take it easy today. You know, maybe this is a day I shouldn't go on a super hard, strenuous workout. So right. that's, that's what I do. I know it's not as accurate as the HR. Oh. That's I, you know, I think anything is better than nothing. Um, exactly. I think that we can really, we can, we, there's still a decent amount of technology that could give us so much more information and become way more in tune with our bodies um, than just, because I think even too, sometimes I'll wake up and I'll feel really pretty decent and then I'll look at that heart rate variability and if it's just slightly off one way or another, I'll just kind of take into account like, oh, well, did anything happen? You know, did I not sleep well? You know, it just, just gives you a little more information. That's all. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's, leaky let's talk gut. about ready? leaky gut or intestinal permeability in yeah, yeah. athletes. Okay. So, so leaky gut, if you don't know what it is, what uh, I'm going to call it leaky gut, but the most, the, the most uh, scientific used term is intestinal permeability. Okay. So leaky gut, I want you to picture like if you, if you made two fists with your hands and you put them right next to each other, um, pretend that the two, your two hands are cells. Okay. Now those cells have what we call tight junctions in between them, meaning that they are, they make up the lining of your gut. So they're not supposed to let anything through unless it uses the proteins to go directly through the cell. 
what can happen though is when we have inflammation of the GI tract, either due to a really, really tough workout that uses up glutamine and just takes it all out of the gut and creates an inflammatory uh, response in the gut. If we're eating a lot of gluten and it's releasing zonulin, that can create an inflammatory response in the gut. Uh, and I'm talking, some people are more sensitive to it than others, but I'm saying like, if you're eating something like cereal for breakfast and then a sandwich for lunch, and then you're also eating pasta or pizza for dinner, that's what I'm talking about. That is an insane amount of gluten that you're exposing your body to. Right. So do I, do, will you hear me say you shouldn't eat sandwiches? No. Will you hear me say you shouldn't eat pizza or pasta? No, but I will tell you that you should eat them within reason <laughs> sure. and not every day all the time. Okay. So Gluten causes the cells to release zonulin, creates an inflammatory response. Uh, if you have food sensitivities or food allergies that you don't know about, food sensitivities are usually the ones you don't know about. You know about food allergies because they make you, you know, go, go into anaphylaxis usually, right. but, um, or break out all over. Um, but food sensitivities can create inflammation of the GI tract. Lots and lots and lots of different things, okay? So what happens though is when you have that for too long of a period of time, those cells, so take your fists and start to like, you know, let them pull apart just a little bit. And so it starts to create this environment where things that are in the GI tract that shouldn't be going into the bloodstream are now going into the bloodstream. So that can be things like take, take, uh, if you eat eggs for breakfast and those eggs are supposed to get broken down into vitamins and minerals and amino acids before they're able to go through the cell into the bloodstream to be used by your body. But if they are undigested and they're making it into the bloodstream, what happens? Well, you're, it's a foreign object, just like a pathogen, just like bacteria, just like a virus, it's foreign. So the body creates antibodies to it. And then it has one of two options. It starts to break it down and kill it, but you're activating your immune system at that time, okay? Also, it only has a few different modes to get rid of it. Either it has to get it, you know, broken down in the cells and then, you know, got, getting rid of and it's using it not for what it's intended to be. It can go through the liver and then most of the time what happens is you'll see it get pushed out through the skin. So you'll see things like psoriasis, you'll see things like acne, you'll see lots of types of skin stuff happen when the system is just overloaded. So leaky gut and intestinal permeability are this state where the GI tract is just not functioning properly. It's inflamed and it's chronically inflamed. So if you are consistently putting in um, a lot of training and you're not putting in a lot of anti-inflammatory things into your system and then you're not paying attention to anything that's going on in your body, you, you, over time, this process happens. And then eventually one day it kind of all breaks down. I think I read a study that, um, that four to 10 years prior to getting an autoimmune disease, you can have symptoms, but not have a diagnosis or know exactly what's going on. And the reason for that is because m a lot of autoimmune diseases, I think most of them start front with auto with leaky gut. Um, and intestinal right. permeability at some point. And I can find the research article for that too. The, the reason, yeah, the reason for that though is because what happens is you're just triggering the immune system over and over and over again. And you have these silent and reactive phases before the autoimmune disease actually creates enough organ damage to, to pop up on a lab, which then your medical doctor finds, right? So usually auto, uh, autoimmune patients- They're patient, looking for it too, right? Right. Right. And, and I should also, I don't mean to go into autoimmune disease. There's just so many things to talk about when we get That's into another all this, podcast for sure. It is for sure. Um, but just, just something to keep in mind that especially when we're looking at nutrient deficiencies, autoimmune disease can be one of those things that if you're looking at this inflammatory state and it happens a lot in athletes, um, you know, there's a lot of symptoms that usually lead up to it prior to it actually being diagnosed as autoimmune. Um, so just to keep that in mind that, that uh, nutrient deficiencies often will be a precursor to chronic illness and chronic disease. So it's, it's another reason to be tracking things and just making sure, especially if you have it as a genetic thing in your family, lots of ways right. you can prevent stuff. So exactly. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm real interested in this because I was, you know, every time I work out hard, like sometimes I just feel sick and there's a, there's a lot of research going out there saying, Hey, if you work out really hard, like, like you said, you lose a lot of that glutamine, that gut barrier can right. trigger some zonin release. And basically LPS is now getting into the bloodstream 
And, and the blood is going up to other things like the heart, it's going to the cardiomyocytes. And so I'm just wondering like, Hey, maybe I'm having like these slight sepsis feelings or having people that work and say, Hey, I feel really sick after I work out. Like I'm cramping. Like I don't feel going to feel lightheaded. I'm like, well, maybe, you know, it's tone down the workout of course, but like find out like why your gut is, you know, becoming so easily disrupted. Maybe it's the, the diet you're eating. Maybe it's the yeah. lack of nutrient, et cetera. So yeah, you know, I think it's something that athletes should consider. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, because you hear about triathletes all the time that are healthy and then they, mm-hmm. they pass out or whatever. It, I mean, maybe that's something for like a familial hypercholesterolemia type deal, but maybe it's something else. We just got to look into it more because I think more and more research is definitely coming out on the subject. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. So we've nailed a lot today. I want to talk yeah. about um, with just your personal experience being an athlete, yeah. kind of like your pre-race nutrition, maybe like that month leading sure. up to your Ironman, mm-hmm. what kind of foods that you're eating, what kind of supplements you're taking, okay. how are you do- what are you doing to prepare your body? Just yeah, I'll try to half, keep half Iron Man and so, now for the yes. coming up in October. Okay. I'll try to keep it a little more succinct too. So, okay. Uh, one of the things too, I wanted to say is that people, uh, so I, when I was starting to learn to train for triathlons, I was trying to absorb as much information as possible. And most people talk about what nutrition they do on race day, but they never talk about what they do prior up to it. And I don't know if that means they're not doing anything <laughs> or if <laughs> they just don't think it's interesting to talk about. But I actually think it's your nutrition leading up to the event that's more effective than the day with the caveat. I'll tell you what I do on the day. But the whole idea about carb loading the night before not effective if you so if you if you look at science and if you look at how the body uses glucose it's all of the times that you've trained up until your competition and event where you've figured out how to use glucose properly and stored it well enough that then on race day your body knows how to access it and use it and then it's the little tweaks throughout your day that it does that it does what it does um so Uh, Leading up to a half Ironman, for example, I cut out all inflammatory foods uh, about a month and a half to two months before. Um, I'll be doing the same thing for the full What foods for you are inflammatory, like gluten, nightshades? What what foods do you cut out? um, So typically dairy is usually something I always keep out because it causes breakouts for me. So personally, I don't like to get breakouts on my face, so I avoid it. Um, Unless I'm craving cheese. If I crave cheese, I usually think it's my body asking for calcium, and so I will eat cheese. But I'm so adapted to this point where I just don't eat dairy. Um, So if I start to crave cheese, I'm like, okay, well, let's let's eat some calcium. And then what's interesting though is that goes away, and I don't eat I don't eat cheese after that. So that's kind of one way to start paying attention to what your body's craving and thinking, and and learning more about what's in certain foods, so that in your head with nutrition, you can kind of say, oh, this is what my body's needing right now, not the I'm just going to eat cheese all the time type thing. Okay. Uh, I also avoid gluten for the most part, just because it's inflammatory for predominantly everyone. I don't, I will still eat whole grains though. I don't cut out that as like a whole group. So I'm still eating wild grain rices. I'm still eating a wide variety of them, black rice, red rice. I mean, long grain rice, all sorts. Um, talking about eating things like farro and, um, amaranth and, Ooh, lots of bulgur, lots and lots and lots of different types. Okay. Um, and some of them are, so sometimes I'll have oats and sometimes I'll have wheat in them, but again, it's the overall overarching that I try to cut out. Alcohol is another really, really big one that I try to make sure I just do not consume prior to, um, you wait for Again, after the race, right? Yeah, I wait for after the race. And it, yeah, so on a normal basis, I do drink alcohol, but I don't, I, but prior to a race, this is something that's extremely important to me. And so cutting it out is kind of like, I'm not feeling guilty going to an event with a bunch of friends and saying, oh no, I'm just going to drink water or drink whatever today. Right. Um, and they're like, well, why aren't you drinking? Well, because I have an Iron Man coming up, and I yeah. don't want to feel like garbage. Like I have no guilt or no shame over that at right. all, right? Is that and one on month? The, is that one month before or how long? It's about two months, two months one and okay. a half months to two months, okay. depending. Very yeah, cool. 
Yeah. Cause it get, you've got to remember that it takes a while for your body to really heal and come down from any type of inflammatory food. Sugar can take anywhere between two to four weeks to fully get out of your system. And I think gluten wheat effects can take anywhere between two to three weeks. So I, I just give my body a lot of time, not only to get it out, but then to start healing from, you know, all that exposure to. You definitely don't want to get sick in between. No, right, right yeah, race, right, right, or have an injury right, right before a race. So, right, exactly. And sugar, of course, sugar is another one that I cut out um, pretty much the whole whole thing. So okay. that's what I do prior. So again, focusing on really well sourced proteins, really well sourced animal meat. Um, I, I, as I said, I try to raise it on my farm, or I try to get it from another farmer that raises it. I want to know where it comes from, or we hunt. So I want to know where it comes from. The other thing is I will raise, I will grow a lot of my veggies and try to deal with that um, and store them. Otherwise, I'm getting a lot of organic veggies, hopefully locally farmed and locally grown if I can, uh, eating lots of different colors, fruits, different co colors of veggies, fruits, um, and then decent amount of fat. Um, carbohydrates are hard though, especially if you're trying a whole, whole other podcast again talking about carbohydrates and insulin resistance and how to use that properly and use fats properly and be adapted and for that but let's do it uh, yeah but <laughs> no seriously we totally can it's it's um but anyway so i i use kind of the paleo-esque format um for eating um, prior to an event, just trying to cut out inflammatory foods and optimize that as much as possible. I think the best thing takeaway, nine to 12 servings of fruits and veggies a day, if you can, and that's not too much fiber for your gut. Then the last thing is that race day, you asked me, what do I do? So I will make sure I have food on my bike. Um, and I use hammer nutrition predominantly. So I'll use their, their gels. Um, and then I'll have heed, which is their form of Gatorade without all the sugar and the sodium. I'll also have some sodium supplements that are on my bike and on my run because, um, I think that sodium has a much is, is, is underrated when it comes to endurance sports. Oh, sure. Um, and then I will make sure to be getting about 40 to 60 grams of carbs, uh, every 30 minutes to an hour. So it's basically a couple, it's a gel and out a half an hour and, and like a, a carbohydrate drink. So I'll just be monitoring that throughout the day, but also trying to eat food. One thing I, while on out, the race on the bike, on the bike. Yeah, yeah. Eat solid food. So, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll bring a peanut butter and jelly with me or a banana or something like that, that just, um, is whole food, uh, kind of on the sugary side, but try to get some whole food into my system. Because one thing that I found out is that with, with just gels and kind of that kind of stuff, it just destroys my gut. And then the run is not very much fun. So yeah, <laughs> you've got to, you got to learn. I think, um, again, that's another reason for doing a lot of long runs on occasion with, through your training season so that you can actually, and long events through your training season. So you can try out different things and make sure it works because there's nothing worse than spending time on the toilet during your run. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't, don't experiment on race day. No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go. That's kind of what I do. That's awesome. I love that two months. So that's two months getting yeah. ready, totally yep. priming your body for mm -hmm. the adventure undertaking. So that's so which cool. is in really just a couple months now. Um, for going to be starting that race. soon. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So if people want to come follow me over on social media, they can watch me as I go through all of that. Are oh, you going to do it live? Um, like I will talk a lot about it uh, leading up to the event. Um, you know, once I start training a lot more, I start talking about it a lot more on Instagram. <laughs> so, cool. Well, I yeah. guess that, that's a good segue. So uh, yeah. where can people find you on social media? Where can yeah. they find more information about you and your practice mm -hmm. and all the things you're doing athletically, like this Ironman coming up soon? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Kirsten. So it's K I R S T I N D R K I R S T I N. We can link it. Uh, you can also find me at my clinic and my practice at uh, nwfunctionalmedicine.com. So that's northwestfunctionalmedicine.com. And then you can also find me at drkirsten.com. That's my personal website where I talk about a lot of other things that don't have to do with my clinical practice but still have to do with health. Uh, you can also, I would suggest uh, come and find me over on Instagram and send me a message because 
I have a free Facebook group where I try to get everybody into to, to just give a lot of just free stuff to people. It's free, you know, I'm, I'm constantly engaged in that group, answering questions, just trying to help, you know, people however I can. So I highly recommend coming over and, and getting into that group. It's called the Healthiest Strongest You, and you can find it on Facebook. Um, Say it again one more time. Healthiest Strongest You. So Healthiest Strongest You. Got yeah, it. Yeah, we can okay. link that too. So, yep, that's that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was so fun talking about nutrient oh, yeah. with you. Thank you. We're going yeah, to have, to have you come fun. back on, probably talk about autoimmune, mm -hmm. uh, leaky gut again. Uh, we mm -hmm. can talk about so many different things. And obviously, you're, I love the pre-race nutrition. That was awesome. Maybe we can do a full segment on that. Yeah, and, um, for sure. And is there anything else you'd like to add uh, that we didn't talk yeah. about? Really quickly. Okay. So um, I want to just talk about labs real fast. Oh, so, yes. We forgot yeah. that. Yeah. It's all good. You guys heard me talk about uh, the Nutravel panel that I that I like to run through Genova Diagnostics. I also will typically run a several. I'll use several different companies for a GI panel lab that you can. A lot of these you can be doing at home. But I just want to talk really quickly about. Just make sure that you know the labs that you are using, and you've kind of researched a little bit more behind them, because. It's awesome that a lot of more, like a lot more labs are becoming a lot more accessible. You can run them at home and you don't even have to go through a doctor in order to order them, which is absolutely amazing. But sometimes their techniques and the way that they produce that um, can have some errors. And so I just want people to be aware that just, just know who you're getting your labs from. Second, a lab is a lab. <laughs> if you don't have somebody to help you apply it and know what's going on behind the scenes, a vitamin C, a vitamin A deficiency, a D, B, sorry, a B vitamin deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, all of those things don't, like you can take a supplement all day long, but again, if your GI tract is jacked and you aren't absorbing that from your food, um, well, you need to fix that because that is going to just create more problems. Like you can take supplements all day long, but if you don't actually fix the problem, you're wasting time. Okay. So and that's money, just what, right? and money and money. Yeah. So I just say that if you are trying to figure out number one, trying to optimize your performance so that you can have better results, better times. If you want to win an event, there are definitely ways that you can, uh Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Uh, there are definitely ways that you can, uh, optimize your performance by actually looking at your systems. How is your body functioning? Optimize it so that it can do the work for you. Um, then also, if you have something that's preventing you from doing the things that you like to do and you love to do, and if you're not running because of constant swollen knees, which is a sign of inflammation, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways that, and hypothyroid, and you're just fatigued all the time, get it worked on. Find somebody in your area that's a functional medicine practitioner that works with this, that knows what they're doing, you know, and, and don't get ignore on. it. Don't ignore it because it is your health, your body, you get one. So, that's you know, right. take care of it and, and, uh, it will take care of you literally. Right. So, yeah. So the home tests, like you said, home mm -hmm. tests are good. Sometimes you take it, you don't really know how to apply it. Right. And so can you explain like why, why you like home tests and why you don't like them? Yeah, I like home tests because specifically even like right now with COVID, I've been able to take a lot of my, my appointments online through telemedicine, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and so I can order a lab, have them run it at home and call it good. Um, some other companies, I'm not going to name any, but there's some other companies that you can order different um, hormone panels and different uh, CBC chem panels, things that just give you a lot more information about what's going on in your body. Those are awesome because I think that it just starts to give people some responsibility into their own health and start taking taking action, you know, for themselves. Yeah. And I love it. I think taking any type of testing that you can do to give you more information about what's happening is fabulous. You should absolutely do it. Just, you know, um, use it wisely and be, think critically, you know, think, always ask yourself why, why is, why did this show up? Why did this show up? You know, and then start, keep digging until you kind of find those answers. And usually you'll, you'll come back to some pretty like the, the loops that you'll find will start leading you back to the same places. And usually that's where you want to start. Right. Like if you're a guy, why is my testosterone low? Well, yeah. I'm not sleeping. I have a baby. Right. My stress is right. high. I'm not right. working or, out or whatever. Yep. 
So, yep, you haven't been doing enough strength training, building up sure, enough muscle, things, which is yeah. what helps to improve testosterone. Exactly. So, all those things. Okay. All those things. So, I kind of go backwards here. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Okay. Okay. If you yeah. were on a desert island and you could take, I guess for you, a food or maybe a supplement, what would you choose and why? Mm, quick fire. Uh, <laughs> What would I choose? Okay, I, oh, this is going to sound super weird. So either I would take a multivitamin supplement. That's what I would choose, yeah. If I could, I would take like a, a, like an actual liver organ. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so the liver is a huge multivitamin. Um, it's actually, so for people who switch over to like the carnivore diet, it's extremely important that they actually eat all of the organs and meat. So liver being one of them holds t B vitamins, tons, tons go. of them. So if you can, I uh, like liver would be the thing because that would be, that would be a lot. Nice. I, I'd probably rather take the supplement. I know uh, most people liver. would too, right. but actually if you can, if you can find ways to, to, to cook liver that tastes good, which you can. Um, it actually is, is, is a great form. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I like it. Um, if you could do a billboard then you could have one or two sentences, health related, it could be general, it could be specific, mm -hmm. just things that you think everyone should do to have a healthier world. What would, what would those things be? What would you say? Okay. The first sentence, uh, keep asking why. The second sentence being, you only have one body, take care of it. Awesome. I love it. Short and sweet. Perfect. Perfect. And so you're an athlete. I'm interested. We already heard about the HRV testing. What is your, uh, your morning routine like? How, how does your first uh, hour of your day look yeah. like? Yeah. Okay. So the first hour of my day is yeah, taking my heart rate variability. Uh, and then trying really hard not to open up social media, <laughs> which gets the best of me sometimes. Yep, me too. Um, I get right up and actually I will go and make coffee and then I head out to do the chore. So to open up, let the chickens out and to get outside, feed the goats, feed the dogs, our livestock guardian dogs that are out there. Um, and in the summer, you know, water all my plants and veggies and stuff, but I get right outside right away. And I is in the summer. I love it. I hate the rain personally, but, um, in the, in the summer, it's great. Uh, I get right outside and then I come back in, grab a cup of coffee. And then on a good day, I'll start making breakfast and then I'll sit down and eat it and enjoy my coffee and just create space during that time. And if I can, um, I will also get in some meditation time. Uh, usually about five to 10 minutes is pretty normal. If I don't get it in, in the morning, I will do it in the evening. And if, and on an ideal day, I'll do a little bit of yoga and then like a journaling meditation time and then like a learning time. So doing something like either reading a book that helps me, you know, improve either self growth wise or in business or something like that. But it varies depending on the day if I have enough time for that. That's awesome. I love that. I wish I had enough time to do that right now. We have a new baby. So my morning Kiddos, routine is off. Man. off. <laughs> they, they just throw it all off. They you throw just it all off, it. right? But um, yeah. okay, eventually. Well, Dr. K, thank you so much for coming on today. It was so fun picking thank your you brain on nutrient deficiencies. For anyone listening, please check out Dr. K on Instagram. Check out our websites. We're going to post all of this in the show notes, and we'll definitely have her back on soon. And we'll definitely uh, keep you all updated on her race, her Ironman races coming up in October. So very Yay. excited to see, hear, hear all about that. And uh, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, my pleasure. All right, bye guys. See y'all next time.